Could the most hated character in the Bible also hold the key to understanding the ongoing battle between good and evil? Who exactly is Satan? Is he a real being or just a myth? For many, Satan is seen as the ultimate symbol of evil, God's enemy, and the embodiment of sin. But the truth behind this figure is much more complicated than that. From a fallen angel to the ruler of the underworld, Satan's influence has been profound, challenging both believers and skeptics to rethink what they know about right and wrong. If you're ready to unearth the hidden truths and myths surrounding this banished angel, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share your thoughts or questions in the comments below. Satan, the devil, Lucifer. These are some of the names given to this being over time. Did you know that Satan comes from Hebrew and means adversary? This evil figure has been shown in different ways throughout history, from a fallen angel to a horned demon. But what's his real story? Before evil existed, way before humans came around, there was pure goodness in heaven. Everything was perfect. Every angel shone brightly and respected their father, the creator of all. Among them was Lucifer. He was the leader, the wisest and the most honored angel, almost like the star of the show. He was God's first creation and was given great power and intelligence, second only to God. Lucifer, who's now known as Satan in Christianity, isn't talked about much in the Bible, but it does explain where evil comes from. There are over 200 verses about its evil figure in the Holy Scriptures. The devil is known to Bible scholars as the source of all human tragedies, sin, and hatred. To understand the world's current state, we need to look at the devil from a divine perspective. God explains the devil's origin in Ezekiel 28, 13, 17. In Eden, the garden of God you were, every precious stone adorned you carnelian, topaz, and emerald, chrysolite, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. In this passage, the Bible describes Lucifer as a powerful and protective cherub. Cherubs are high-ranking angels, just below seraphim, and are known for their two pairs of wings. They guard God's glory, the heavens, and the stars. Although they're not visible to humans, their divine light can positively influence us. Lucifer, the most respected and beautiful cherub, was part of this divine order until wickedness was found in him. And this is important because it shows that God didn't create evil. He created something perfect. Satan is the one who brought evil into existence. The devil started out as an archangel, perfect in beauty and wisdom. He was known as the Morning Star, a name given to no other creature. He was also called the Protective Cherub and held a special and privileged position. Even his clothes were made of precious stones reflecting the glorious light of the Trinity. So how did this magnificent archangel become the devil? Though once holding a privileged position as one of the most powerful angels close to God, Satan's excessive ambition led to his own downfall. The scriptures give us some hints about what caused his tragic fall. Firstly, it seems that pride was the main sin that corrupted Satan. Blinded by his own greatness and beauty, he started to think highly of himself and question God's ultimate authority. The prophet Ezekiel talks about how Satan's heart swelled with pride because of his beauty, Ezekiel 28, 17, while Isaiah quotes Satan as saying, I will climb to the tops of the clouds. I will be like God most high, Isaiah 14, 14. This rebellious and arrogant attitude made Satan desire to take over God's throne and set up his own kingdom. He wanted to be worshipped and to have the glory that only belongs to God. 
In his relentless pursuit of power and recognition, he openly challenged God's established order, sparking an unprecedented cosmic conflict. Besides pride, envy also played a big part in Satan's fall. When he saw the glory of the Creator and maybe sensed the redemption plan for humanity, he got jealous and resentful. He couldn't stand the thought of humans, who were below him, receiving unconditional love from God. This mix of pride, excessive ambition, and envy led him to openly defy God, causing a rebellion that split the heavenly forces. Even though Satan was powerful and clever, he couldn't beat God's strength, and he got kicked out of heaven along with his fallen angels. But expelled to where? Popularly, it's believed that Satan is the absolute ruler of hell, a realm of eternal torment and endless suffering. However, this notion is more a product of folklore and human imagination than biblical teachings. In the most well-known mention of hell, Jesus talks about the final fate of those who don't believe, saying they'll face eternal fire along with the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, 41. But it's not mentioned that Satan is their ruler. In fact, the scriptures depict Satan as a condemned being, stripped of all real power and authority. His reign is temporary and limited, and his ultimate fate is to be cast into the lake of fire and sulfur, along with the beast and the false prophet, Revelation 20.10. As you can see, Satan is clearly described as tormented in the lake of fire, not as the tormentor. So, far from being the master of hell, Satan is a condemned prisoner destined to share the same fate as those who followed him in his rebellion. So why do we tend to believe that this malevolent being is seated on an iron throne in the depths of the fiery hell? The idea may come from the epic poem by Dante Alighieri, The Divine Comedy, written between 1308 and 1321. Dante's poem describes the brutal descent of sinners into the underworld. It's written in the first person as Dante narrates his imaginative journey through the three realms of the dead, Inferno, Hell, Purgatorio, Purgatory, and Paradiso, Heaven. But it's nothing more than that, an imaginative journey inspired by sacred scriptures, not only from the Catholic Bible, but also from Islamic religion. From here, many other artworks and literary pieces, like Dan Brown's novel Inferno, follow Dante's example and portray Satan as the ruler of Hell. But even though this foul place is filled with evildoers, Satan isn't the one steering the ship. It's God who's in charge. So, what's Satan's real role in the world? Well, according to scriptures, he's the tempter, the one who tries to lead people away from God's path. But why does he get to do this? It's because of free will and moral testing. God gave humans the ability to choose between good and evil, and that choice wouldn't be real if there wasn't something tempting them to choose wrong. That's where Satan comes in. He acts as a spiritual opponent, testing our faith and commitment to following God's ways. This moral test isn't about being cruel. It's part of God's plan to help humanity. Let's remember that even Jesus had to go through this. After fasting for 40 days and nights in the desert, he was physically exhausted and emotionally vulnerable. It was at that precise moment when Satan appeared to him, seizing the opportunity to test his loyalty to the Heavenly Father. Through these temptations, Satan sought to divert Jesus from his redemptive mission, appealing to his human needs, planting doubts about his identity, and offering tempting shortcuts to power and earthly glory. Satan was just doing his job, and he's still at it today, because that's been his purpose ever since he got kicked out of heaven. But that's not the only time he's been busy. Throughout the Holy Scriptures, the figure of Satan appears as a common thread that intertwines many of the most significant stories and events. From Genesis to Revelation, his presence permeates some of the most emblematic and symbol-laden narratives. Take the Garden of Eden, for example. That's where Satan first shows up, disguised as a sneaky snake. 
He takes advantage of Adam and Eve's innocence, the first people God created, and plants doubt and disobedience in their minds. With tricky words, he questions God's rule about not eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, hinting that God might be hiding something. You'll be like God, knowing everything, he tells them. Genesis 3, 5. Adam and Eve fall for it, tempted by the idea of gaining wisdom and power. And we all know how that turned out. It changed everything for humanity. This foundational story not only introduces Satan as the great tempter, but also establishes his key role in mankind's fall and the entry of sin into the world. Through his actions, Satan openly challenges divine authority and sows discord between God and the newly created humanity. Centuries later, in the epic tale of Job, Satan appears again as an instrument of divine testing, challenging the integrity and faith of this righteous and God-fearing man. With the Almighty's permission, because Satan can't do anything without God's permission, Satan has power, but it's limited. That means, while he may have some rule over the earth, his rule is incomplete. Satan subjects Job to a series of terrible calamities, including the loss of his possessions, his family, and his health. Despite his unspeakable suffering, Job remains steadfast in his faith, rejecting Satan's insinuations and the counsel of his own acquaintances to curse God. It was a spiritual war where God put forth his best warrior. In the end, God intervenes himself, rebuking Satan for his malice and restoring Job with double what he had lost. This only demonstrates the limited power of Satan, and though it might sound like everything settled, nothing could be further from the truth. According to the Bible, we're in an eternal spiritual warfare, and one of the fighters who has been on the front lines for centuries is none other than Archangel Michael, the mighty leader of the heavenly hosts. One of his early encounters with Satan is documented in the book of Jude 1, 9 when he and Satan argue over the body of Moses. Though it's never explained exactly why they were arguing, Jude describes the outcome. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. It's believed that Satan was trying to find out where Moses was buried, hoping to break God's first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Satan wanted to tempt the Jewish people into worshiping Moses' body. The biggest battle between Archangel Michael and Satan is described in the book of Revelation 12, 7, 9, when Satan's evil angels try to rebel against God. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. This decisive victory of Michael over Satan and his hosts symbolizes the ultimate triumph of good over evil. However, as the passage indicates, Satan and his followers were cast down to earth, where they would continue their war against God and humanity. But because of this great battle, Archangel Michael is considered the great defender of the church. However, we can't help but wonder if this battle actually took place. That's why we need to review some theological interpretations. Some see this confrontation as a literal event that occurred in heaven before the creation of the physical world. Others interpret it as a symbol of the ongoing spiritual struggle between the kingdom of God and the forces of darkness. Regardless of the specific interpretation, the battle between Michael and Satan symbolizes the eternal struggle between good and evil, light and darkness. We see this best in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, that prophetic and symbolic work that describes the events of the end times. In this visionary account, the figure of Satan occupies a central place playing a key role in the final events leading up to the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. 
Throughout the book of Revelation, Satan is depicted under various symbolic forms such as the dragon or the beast. He's described as the great deceiver who seduces nations and leads them into rebellion against God. At a crucial moment, Satan gathers the armies of the earth in a place called Armageddon, where a final battle against the forces of the Messiah will take place. However, this confrontation won't be a victory for Satan. The Bible predicts that Jesus, the Lamb of God, will defeat the beast and its armies, putting an end to its rule of deceit and evil. Revelation 19, 19, 21. After this defeat, Satan will be locked away in the abyss for a thousand years, unable to deceive anyone during that time. Revelation 20, 1, 3. But at the end of this period, he'll be set free briefly for his final judgment. So, if the struggle between Archangel Michael and Satan represented the eternal battle between good and evil with the apocalypse, comes the eternal defeat of evil by good. It also marks the beginning of a new era of peace, justice, and harmony in the restored creation. The presence of evil and the corrupting influence of Satan will be eradicated forever, allowing redeemed humanity to enjoy an unobstructed relationship with their Creator. No more falls, no more temptations, just a world that until now seems merely utopian. Whether we take it literally or not, beyond the narrative aspects, the story of Satan teaches us profound lessons about morality, choice, and the importance of staying firm in faith. He's the cunning tempter in Eden sowing the seed of disobedience in the hearts of Adam and Eve. He's the relentless adversary challenging Jesus' redemptive mission in the desert and on the Mount of Olives. He's the instrument of divine testing subjecting Job to terrible suffering, testing his unwavering faith. But understanding the figure of Satan goes beyond simply seeing him as a one-dimensional villain. His presence in scriptures challenges us to question our own notions of good and evil and to reflect on the nature of sin, temptation, and redemption. Ultimately, Satan's narrative is one of choice. It reminds us that like the first humans in Eden, we all face decisions that can either draw us closer to or further away from God's will. And you, what do you think about Satan's story? What lessons have you learned from his fall and his ultimate fate? And most importantly, whose side are you on? I'll see you in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more fascinating content about the eternal truths revealed in the scriptures.